From bitter uh, football rivalries to beer preferences, the Dutch and Germans have a long and complicated history. The two countries have grown from neighbors to friends, in the words of German President Frank Walter Steinmeier. But what challenges and opportunities arise from a changing geopolitical landscape? Here to talk about Dutch-German relations is Ronald van Ruden. He is the ambassador of the Netherlands to Germany with over 40 years of experience in foreign relations. We are very excited to welcome him on our stage. This is Elias, my name is Patrick, and now let's have a warm round of applause for Ronald van Roden. So thank you so much for joining us today. How does it feel to be back in the Netherlands? Well, it's always nice, but of course the Netherlands is not that far away. Okay. It's, uh, by train it takes quite a long time. Uh, too long, actually, I, I believe, but, um, but then by car, it's, it's a bit quicker. <laughs> yeah. I haven't tried biking, so one of my features <laughs> after that, they return to the Netherlands uh, on bike. <laughs> and uh, did, do you miss Berlin already? Is there, is there already? Yeah, you always miss Berlin. Yeah? Yeah. No, but it's a very really exciting place. <laughs> and there's much going on. But of course, you stay, in, you stay in touch with people working in the embassy, with people you know. I mean, it's, it's never far away. Is there something you specifically miss about the city? Sorry? Is there something you specifically miss about the Well, I think I miss, actually, it's, uh, it's, I think like Amsterdam, it's a very lively city. And um, actually, this, uh, it's, it's very large. So I, I took a habit in exploring Berlin by bike, which is uh, very easy because it's flat like the Netherlands. Uh, but then always you, you're surprised how big it actually is. So I always plan on routing on the map and it's always bigger than I expected. There's a lot to explore. <laughs> okay. A any hidden gems you uh, uncovered? Yeah, well, I think there are very nice, th th there's very nice neighborhoods and also like, um, like Kreuzberg, like Wenzlauerberg. Uh, actually, you also have to find the coins where you have nice markets, nice squares. Uh, there's a lot of tourists as well, like Amsterdam. What I like as summer is biking outside to the outskirts of the city. You have very lovely lakes with very clean water. Yeah. And they're perfect for a swim. So that's something I like to do oh, okay. sometimes on summer evenings. That's great to do. Some people do that as well in winter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it can be really cold. Oh, okay. Uh, we will uh, open the interview with a, a rapid fire uh, question series. Um, we will read out the five statements to which you can only answer yes or no. So are, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Germany has the superior bread. No. Dutch is the more beautiful language. No. Living in Berlin is better than Amsterdam. Yes. The best I beer in Amsterdam. <laughs> uh, daring statement. The best beer in the world comes from Germany. No, it's no. Okay. In a football match, I cheer louder for the Netherlands playing against Germany. Sorry, in a football match? Uh, you cheer louder for the Netherlands rather yeah. than Germany. Yes. Okay. Okay. So you still feel... Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and the, the best beer? Uh, can you elaborate? I uh, I like Erd er Erdinger mm -hmm. in Germany. It's a very it's a very great Weizen beer. It's a it's a good beer. Okay. Well, uh, we'll make German beers are better than the mo most Dutch brands. <laughs> okay. Well, sure. we'll we'll make sure to pass a note to Heineken. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. okay. Um, we 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 were wondering because you you have been posted for some time now in in Berlin. Uh, and of course, in the Netherlands, there are a lot of stereotypes uh, re re regarding Germany. Have you found any of them to be true? No, not really, because I think stereotypes uh, nowhere actually, uh, um, they, could, they always contain some truth. There's some truth in everything. At the same time, I experienced that the variety uh, in Germany, uh, if you talk cultural terms, if you talk people, is is as large or even larger than in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So if you, most stereotypes do not apply. And if you look at those two cultures, uh, yes. what do you think is the biggest difference between those two? Well, I think that, 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 that one I find very difficult to explain. You, you might say that um, in Germany, of course, I have many official meetings uh, where you're invited, you meet with the mayor or you meet with the local minister president of one of the states. It's a bit more ceremonial. It's a bit more ceremonial than in the Netherlands. 
always uh, there, there, there's, there's some flag waving. You have to write something in the gold in the book in the gold book. Uh, but so um, we we are perhaps in the Netherlands a bit more informal. Okay. So that is uh, you you can say uh, jij and jou and, and in Germany actually people won't do that that quickly. You say see uh, and of course they continue doing so. Even people that have been working together for years. Okay. Uh, so that uh, it's, okay. it's a bit more formal. And this formality, do you have a guess why that is? Um, I don't know. I don't know why that is. I think it is, you might say, in mo most countries, it is uh, the culture is a bit more formal than in the Netherlands. I think we are a bit more part of an Anglo-Saxon culture, which is more informal. Okay. You have the same informality. I've been uh, in, working in Scandinavia, Scandinavian countries, uh, uh, America, Netherlands. It's a bit more informal. And did you already have a cultural uh, faux pas, so to say? A cultural faux pas? Not that I knew of. You <laughs> <laughs> should have killed it before then. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Okay, yeah. Oh. Um, let's see. So, you move to a new country, something that diplomats often need to do. Um, how do you manage to integrate yourself as quickly as possible? Well, actually, that starts with, uh, and of course, Germany, in a way, is not the most difficult places to be. I've, al al I've also been working, for instance, in Iraq, in Baghdad, and that's a different story altogether. Um, but of course, you start with uh, getting to know as many people as quickly as possible. So there's there's a lot of appointments, and of course, that varies from, from uh, people in the neighborhood you want to know, but also, of course, people at the political level, uh, people within ministries, people that in the cultural sector, economic sector. So actually, you need to build up your network. I mean, diplomacy is all about networking. So that's actually a first task when you when you enter in, when you enter into a new country. And do you then still have time left to speak to the average uh, German to get a feeling of of? Well, not that much. You do that basically. You do that the weekends, but you meet lo a lot of people when you go to the theater, when you go to the cinema. Mm. And, and actually, one of the things I like about Germany that there's still um, during elections there's still campaigns. People are campaigning. So when you go to a market on a Saturday, you always find people campaigning for. Uh, for one of the parties, and it's easy, it's very easy to get in touch with with these people. Okay, but I find it also when you when you stand in a bookstore, people might just comment on a book they just see you and they they find it interesting. So actually, and in that sense, um, we talk about formalities. You mm -hmm. know, it can also be way informal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, you also briefly touched upon the diplomatic uh, diplomatic life yeah. in the different countries. Um, how does it compare to your previous placements? You already mentioned Norway and Iceland. Yeah, well, I think it's uh, Berlin is a very big city. Uh, it's a big country, Germany. So actually, you have a very intense, let's say, large diplomatic community. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's only true to say that I actually I I know very few of them because I'm so focused on, let's say, uh, Germany and 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 german dutch german interests that i don't really mix up in berlin when i am in berlin i don't mix up in the diplomatic community i'm I'm more busy with let's say german stakeholders um, and next to that berlin is 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 just the capital of germany but it's not germany as such so actually i travel a lot i travel a lot throughout the country and that means that you meet a lot of people but i meet few diplomats whereas oslo in return, also is a very small city with half a million inhabitants. Uh, it's just uh, 60 countries that have an embassy there. So if you there you meet you meet your diplomatic colleagues far more on far more regular basis. Yeah, uh, is it is it something where of of which you think I I would like to uh, uh, go more out and uh, see it more and uh, and experience the people more? Uh? Well, I think it's it, my main focus is not uh, is not diplomats. My focus is German stakeholders okay. mm. yeah. uh, of all segments. Yeah. Uh, actually, you know, there are countries like, for instance, I've been posted in Baghdad at the time of Saddam Hussein, of the regime, mm. that, of course, you had much more frequent contacts with your colleagues from other countries because you wanted to get a picture of what's going on within that government mm. because it was not a very transparent government. And you then you're looking for information. But Germany is very much like the Netherlands. 
I mean, everything that's being discussed within Bundestag, within the government or whatever level, uh, it's out in the open. So I, I don't need my French or American or whatever colleagues to tell me what's going on in Berlin. Do you prefer this type of diplomatic life? This uh, compared to, uh, to, to Wagner? Yeah, I, I, I think so, because of course it's, uh, it's, it's most interesting to, to meet with people, to be able to meet people, to be able to talk to them uh, in a free and open atmosphere. Whereas in other, con part, other countries of the world, uh, people are always a bit, a bit doubtful of what they say, what they can say, what they cannot say. It's much more difficult to get into touch in, in touch with people. Um, is is Berlin considered one of the most uh, coveted spots when it comes to ambassadorships? Well, I think so because Germany is a very important is a very important country to the Netherlands. It's, yeah. it's by far our largest neighbor. Is it above uh, Washington in the table? I wouldn't say I wouldn't say so. I think there are several countries that have, uh, but I'm um, so uh, America, China. I mean, there's so, so many countries that are of interest to the Netherlands, UK, France, but also I think countries that are at first hand smaller, uh, where we have genuine interest. Or some countries are of a high, highly interesting in the political sense. Also, also uh, which country wouldn't you expect the Dutch to have such a big interest? Would I not expect to have? Yeah, so there, 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 there are yeah. countries may, maybe that we don't think of in as in government. Well, that's actually we, we we have we we have hardly had any. Uh, there's currently a very good series on uh, on Dutch broadcast uh, about Central Asian republics. Yeah, it's uh, 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 yellow blood costumes uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and and I think it's it's fascinating the insight they give by just talking to people at all levels of society. Actually, we have some missions there, but you could, by and large, say that the whole Central Asia is a is is, is a blind spot uh, to the Netherlands. Okay. Uh, still, it's a very fascinating, a fascinating area. The same goes to a certain extent for Central Asia, Central America, some places in Africa where we are not that well represented. No, and we should, you think. Well, I think it's very important to have your representations, to have your people all over the world because there's so much going on. Yeah. And I think we use, uh, we have, I mean, as, as the Netherlands is just a small country, we are, we are a small country, but we still have a, a, a large diplomatic uh, representation all over the world. We have about 140 missions worldwide. So, uh, and but I believe that is important. And if we um, compare basically this diplomatic interest of other countries, so for example, for Germany specifically, there is one embassy, two consulates, and 11 honorary consuls. That is almost as much as France, a country three times the size of the Netherlands. Uh, why is that the case? Well, I think Germany has, of course, you could say we have very strong interest. And as I said, it's not just Berlin. Also, Germany is a federal republic mm. where the uh, the lender or state states like Bavaria, Lower Saxony, uh, Northern Westphalia, they have they have considerable influence, considerable powers, and I think that is altogether a bit different from countries like Spain or France, which have a much more centralized government. Mm. So, if you want to be successful in engaging in contacts, in establishing your networks. In Germany, you can't just limit yourself to Berlin. And then, of course, Nordrhein-Westphalia is very important. It's, it's, it's a state the size of the Netherlands. It's very important to Dutch economics. Uh, there's a lot of cross-border communication. Uh, here, one example, there's a lot of students traveling from Germany to the Netherlands. There's a lot of Dutch citizens living in the border region, working in Germany and otherwise. Uh, Bavaria on the other end, southern Germany, uh, Baden Württemberg, Bavaria, they find very uh, many activities relating to the digital transition. So, new industries, uh, companies working on artificial intelligence, etc. So, you want to have a presence there as well. Mm. So, you basically established how important and how um, good the current relationship is. Let us now take a very brief look into the past of the relationship. So after World War II, Rotterdam was in ruins and the Dutch wanted to annex large parts of Western Germany. Um, so 
if we look like at the history, if we take a look, how did those two countries end up being founding members of the EU? Well, I think, of course, that that is to a large extent re exactly related to the history of that war, because I think both governments, post-war governments, I think they were convinced that this was something that should never occur again in Europe and that we had to build structures that would effectively also prevent something like that from happening. Um, the other thing you have to say to that is that we have very strong historical ties with Germany and that goes back to the 16th century. Do you think that helped mending the relationship after the war? Well, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, there, there have always been very intense contacts between the two countries. Uh, I think we also have put a lot of efforts both in the Netherlands and in Germany also to, um, to discuss actually the, the trauma, uh, the traumas, the problems relating to the second world war. And it's an issue that has for a long time been on the forefront of our relationship has been discussed very much in the open is still something that is very, uh, actively and vividly, um, uh, let's say, uh, dealt with by two countries. We have a lot of cooperation between, for instance, the Anne Frank House uh, and the Anne Frank Centrum in Berlin. Uh, th there's a lot of room for commemoration of the atrocities of still of that war. Actually, the fact that we discussed that so openly, and I think has also contributed, contributed to improving the relation. It has it has led to a, a situation where we are much more relaxed about each other, yeah. in, uh, which which is not always which is not an automatic uh, a given thing. Uh, if you compare the relationship of the Netherlands with Germany or or Germany with Poland, uh, where it still is a something that's uh, that that is full of uh, conflict and uh, conflicts relating to that Second World War, do you see that that is still something where he, uh, very, 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 very vivid, very, very much present in relationship. And I think in the Netherlands, Netherlands and Germany, that we don't deny it, we don't ignore it, um, but we also approach it in a in a joint in a joint fashion. Let's suppose tomorrow a new prime minister is installed, and he or she uh, um, says, "Come to my office," and says, "We have thought about it. Germany is so close. Let's close the uh, embassy." Um, Close the embassy. Okay. Okay. What would be your arguments to keep it? Uh, yeah. Well, first I would say it's it's not the competence uh, of the prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would leave that yeah. to the general secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Yeah. But I think it would be, it it would be a, a stupid decision. Yeah. I think I would but also right away. And, and then the question is why? 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 Why, 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 why is it so vital that you have an embassy in? Well, it's a good question because I think because the relationship is so close that many people find their way in Germany. Uh, they don't need the embassy or the consulate in Dusseldorf to tell them what to do. Uh, on the other hand, we facilitate a lot of contacts at the official level. We facilitate a lot of uh, a change in the cultural fields. For instance, we have a, a Leipzig Buchmesse, which is a great book fair in Leipzig that the Netherlands is host country together with Flanders next year. That is something we subsidize. That's something we help preparing. So, uh, so we bring Dutch publishers in contact with German counterparts. Uh, the same goes for political consultations. Uh, the same goes for military cooperation. There's a lot of military cooperation. Uh, where actually our land forces are practically integrated with the German ones. It's another success story, a post-war success story, but actually that also has to be facilitated at the level of government in Berlin. So you need your representatives in Berlin yeah. also to, to spread the message, to, to stay in touch with people on a daily basis. So actually there's, there's a lot of room to, uh, to explain our presence. And we also have consular issues. We still have Dutch people um, ending up in an emergency situation mm -hmm. because, uh, for instance, last week there was this tragic accident involving three Porsches. Oh, yes, yes, we saw on the news. Yeah, and you saw that it was all over the news. But you might say, what has the embassy in Berlin to do with such an accident? Because that's practically, technically being solved by local authorities, etc. 
but still, of course, you have the family members of those victims, those people that, that got killed in that crash, and actually to support those people in finding the right context, getting in touch with the right authorities. That is a task also for an embassy. So that's something we do as well. How about the economic relationships? Is that also on your agenda? Um, sure, that's on the agenda. And again, there goes for uh, a lot of companies selling their products or their services to Germany. They find their way, they're managed. Mm -hmm. uh, but still you have fields like uh, startups that find it more difficult to get into touch. So that we promote a change to fairs, to uh, events that we organize. And then you have big issues where the government gets involved. Uh, for instance, if you discuss, uh, let's say, um, uh, a cooperation in the military field, uh, in, in the uh, acquirement of, of military material, or as we just discussed, uh, the energy infrastructure. Which we'll get into in a second. Yeah. Um, suppose a startup comes to your office and says, Mr. Van Ruden, I would be like to dominate the economic life in this country. Uh, what is the one tip you give them to succeed in Germany? To succeed? Well, I think it's very important that you establish your network so that you get into touch with people. You you have to, that is a very important factor that you can't just come with a glossy magazine and say, well, I have the, I have the perfect product for your uh, solution to your problem. You have to explain it yourself. You have to convince people. Uh, you have to get yourself known. You have mm -hmm. to develop a, a relation of trust. Is that is it often underestimated? Is that the, the sometimes it is. I think the language still counts, although I find that more and more Germans see that also at the level of the government, they are very good in English, they're fluent in English, but still uh, that's not always the case when you talk business to business, especially when you talk about medium-sized enterprises. So the language is important. And what do you expect? They expect the uh, the business leader, to such say the director or the, or the owner, to, to bring the story himself. Okay. What does yeah. it work in Germany when you say, well, I have an excellent product and I'm yeah. going to sell it to you and I have an expert with me who will explain to you yeah. what, what, what this great caress. He is my great deputy. Who is my deputy. Yeah. We have to be able to tell the story yourself. That is important. So it seems there are a lot of advantages for the Netherlands to do business, to live in Germany, but what's in it for Germany to have a good relationship with the Netherlands? Well, I love that. So I think we are the second business partner for Germany, only after China. Mm -hmm. So if you look into the total amount of imports, exports on an annual basis, in why you that it? That's around three billion yeah. euros. That's, uh, that's that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of money. Uh, I think what what Germans appreciate uh, in Dutch businesses is that they are generally very pragmatic. They're innovative. Uh, they're flexible in finding solutions to complex problems. We have a great tradition in logistics. We are very good in organizing logistics. We are also uh, a very important uh, gateway to Germany because of our ports, uh, Rotterdam, but also Amsterdam plays in uh, the, the Amsterdam port still plays a very important uh, role as, uh, in, in raw materials. Uh, so actually there's, there's much to say that is of interest to Germany apart from tulips, cheese, etc., which, which also plays a role. I mean, you don't forget that. Or... You already mentioned the harbors. Yes. Do you think this symbiosis, this relationship between the two countries would have been possible in a less globalized world? Um, I think so, because I think it was, well, of course, the, the position of Rotterdam uh, and Amsterdam that has everything to do with a globalized mm -hmm. world, um, but actually as neighboring countries, I think I, I would say even if we did not like each other, even if we did not want it, we are we are compelled to work together because we are so closely, physically, we are closely mm -hmm. related. But wouldn't, for example, France play a bigger role then, since they are like a bigger economic market? For I don't know, because I think from, from the Netherlands on, you are only uh, within two hours, you are in Germany. Mm -hmm. It's very nearby. Uh, we have the access to the North Sea. Um, I think, and also there is a tradition of a very strong uh, industrial relationship that also goes back to to the, to the beginning of the last century. Mm -hmm. And I think France and Germany have always been competitors, uh, very much 
I think that is one of the factors that have led to the have led to the first and also the second world war is that they were the big competitors in Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, the Netherlands is has never seen as such as, has never been a competitor in in that sense because we are we are smaller. Uh, we don't have the same military power, etc. So mm-hmm. there has always been a, a relationship of trust. Maybe to touch upon that briefly, um, right now, so Scholz and Macron aren't the best of friends, uh, if we have to believe the newspapers. Is it also a strategic chance for the Netherlands to wiggle itself in? It's always important. I mean, it's, uh, I've been working also in Brussels, and actually for the Netherlands, uh, it was always something um, to keep uh, a job, uh, was to find middle ground between then UK, when the UK was still a member of Europe, um, France and Germany. So look for the middle ground and also see to guard your interest. And actually we do that similarly now with Germany and France in Europe, actually, that we were very heavily working on capitals in Paris and Berlin on governments uh, to get actually to get our viewpoints on the table and ensure that our interests are, are, are well guarded. And of course, sometimes you you may act as a bridge builder at the other end, don't be too... Um, you have also have to be realistic. I think France and Germany have enjoy way good relations at all levels. And even if it's if it's presented in the media as if this is not the case, yeah. this is not just dependent on, um, on, the, on, on, the, on, on the persons like the French president or, Sch- or, the, or Sch- Macron or Schultz. I mean, they play a role. Yeah. But also, it's just a role. Because uh, in the financial crisis, you saw that when Sarkozy and Mer- Merkel, for example, agreed on something, mm-hmm. uh, the rest of Europe just had to follow. Yeah, yeah. Well, the good thing is that they don't do not agree too often. No. So, it's, of course, it's true when when France and Germany want something done, that it's it's very difficult. You you almost have to mobilize the whole of the rest of Europe to counteract that successfully. Uh, on the other hand, if they if there's something if they agree on something they don't want, it's also very difficult to yeah. to to get to get through. But uh, it's also true to say that quite often France and Germany uh, have different views on 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 a wide range of topics. Because I I began reading the book by one of your predecessors, Mr. Krop. Yeah. And uh, in the very first chapter, there's your name. Yeah. Um, because um, Sarkozy and Merkel were walking uh, on a beach yeah. in Frankfurt, and they were discussing measures to yeah. uh, battle the, the euro crisis or the financial yeah. crisis. And um, uh, those measures, so the two, two measures that were taken, yeah. the Treaty of Lisbon and the Stability Pact uh, rules, um, they agreed on it on the beach. And then um, Mr. Krop had heard from uh, about it uh, from yeah. the advisor of Merkel, yeah. and he said, I, I I have to make sure they get the message in uh, The Hague. Let me call yeah. Ronald van Rooden. Yeah. And, you, and you, according to the book, you said, well, I've heard about it, that they changed their thinking when yeah. it comes to the stability pact, for example. Um, but m- 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 Minister De Jager concluded after the meeting in which the measures were enacted that yeah. he wanted to be much closer to Germany after that. Was that also maybe... Uh, uh, an experience or a lesson that 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 showed for you how how important the relationship with Germany yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. There's one uh, Manny Strop described that in his book uh, that I was walking and there's one thing that this that that, that does not uh, that's not that does not fit in. He he said that I was walking on the beach uh, with my dog, but I did not have a dog. But I was on the beach, but not with a dog. Yeah. Um, but anyway. Um, I think this was uh, this was at the beginning of the euro crisis when Sarkozy and Merkel indeed met and um, and and seemingly they agreed on something on a package to help Greece out um, uh, but it was really unclear what they had agreed upon mm. and actually what we did then is have having a very active diplomacy basically focused on on Germany saying that uh, if we were going to help out um, it would not be at the expense of the Dutch taxpayer. That was one very important thing. The other thing was that we wanted involvement of the IMF. Yes. Because we did not trust the Commission. We did not trust the Commission with the task of overseeing uh, support programs for Greece. And we said the IMF has a 
decade long experience in helping countries out with, with financial schedules. So we wanted uh, IMF in, and this is exactly how it went. Uh, that's how we managed to, uh, to get the involvement of IMF. And the package deal was that it basically were loans and not gifts. Um, nor did we agree on a sort of European funding mechanism. Yeah. So I think that was, uh, that was around 2010, 2011. Uh, the other thing there, and, and that is something Europe has different, uh, has, has very different um, uh, instruments, but on financial issues, you always have to uh, decide by unanimity. And of course, this gives a country as the Netherlands a different position. Yes. Uh, because in a lot of legislation, you decide by a majority. And there I can raise my flag in Brussels and say, I don't want it. Yeah. But then if I'm not part of a blocking minority, it will just go on. And here in, 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 fin in, in finance, you still have a, you, you have a blocking, you have a blocking for vote. So you can say no to it. And of course, I think the, the prime minister by then, Rutte, he played that out in a, in, in, in a very, very elegant and a very clever way. But if we look at the Dutch-German relationship at that time, uh, both countries were part of the so-called frugal country, yeah. and they have often seen eye to eye in financial matters. Yeah. However, the Dutch were very opposed to the EU recovery funds, yeah. which uh, has been yeah. decided on a few. Yeah, Germany is less frugal than the Netherlands. Exactly. Can yeah. you, uh, first of all, explain the initial opposition of the Dutch towards a recovery fund? Well, I think we, we first of all, we thought that there is enough funds in the uh, in the European budgetary framework. And um, I think that still holds because a lot of that money is not spent. Okay. Uh, and you could use that money as well to deal with a lot of effects of the Corona crisis, because that was part of the problem. Uh, secondly, if you create new funds, then who is going to pay for these funds? And what are the criteria? Are they then really used for those purposes that you have originally devised or are they used for other purposes? So actually, we were very much opposed to these funds. Uh, in the end, um, next gen, it came into place and we accepted it. Of course, on condition that it was a one-time only uh, affair um, and it did not prejudice on, uh, on, 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 on permanent structures. And, and, and the second element was that we, uh, we said, we, you have to apply very strict criteria as to the use of it. It shall be used to greening the economy Greening society uh, and also to uh, to help the digital transformation of your economy too. And how come that Germany uh, eventually was in favor of that? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Um, I think they are in the end in favor because uh, they always feel a certain responsibility for Europe. Uh, more so than the Netherlands. I think more than the Netherlands because they, although we are both founding fathers of the European fathers, parents of the European community, I think they feel, uh, they feel a large responsibility to, to keep the European Union uh, afloat. Whereas in the Netherlands, you see that we say, well, is this in our interest or is it not in our interest? I think we, yeah, yeah. we look more at our, our own balance of interest to say yes or no. Um, um, I think that's one element. The other element is actually, in my view, the fragmentation of Dutch politics by now you have in the um, in the Tweede Kamer second chamber you have 20 parties 20 political parties um, and most of these parties by now are so small that the members in parliament at least they have very little time and energy and knowledge about what is going on elsewhere in the world yeah, yeah. so that means that you get a focus on internal domestic issues Whereas in Germany, you have a Bundestag, more than 700 members, seven parties. Um, All the time. Uh, and it means there's more room yeah. for, uh, and of course, Germany has a different position. It has a different position in Europe. It has a different position in the world. It's, it's a G7 member. It's a member of G20. Yeah. So I think that in part explains also, they feel a different responsibility Yeah, when it goes to dealing with European issues. Well, um, if we say that the relationship or the fundamental truths of the relationship are being challenged, um, um, I think we, we, we would be putting it lightly because uh, there has been a lot of uh, events happening on the geopolitical landscape. Yes. 
Um, and we would look to, but we, we would like to look at some some areas where uh, a lot of movement movement has has happened. Maybe energy is is the most uh, pregnant at the mm. moment, uh, because um, Germany needs, of course, all the gas it can get since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And in July 2020, Germany asked the Netherlands if it could reopen the uh, Groningen gas field. Yeah. And how do you handle such a request? Yeah, well, um, of course, this is one major topic. The other topic is, of course, what happened due to the Russian aggression war in Ukraine. Because I think that that triggered a lot and it meant a lot for the cooperation between the Netherlands and Germany. I'm not sure. But but but, but um, we, we can come back to that perhaps later. Yes. Uh, because that's where actually a lot a lot has happened in the past year. Uh, energy, of course, uh, people in Germany sometimes they ask me, yeah, we understand that uh, the Groninger gas uh, is depleted. And then I said, well, the, the, you had to explain it, it's not a matter of depletion. There's still gas there. You could still produce gas till till the 50s of this century, but that there was another, the road course is different. Um, and I think they quickly understood that that was no possibility. Yeah. Um, but of course, in energy terms, we have always been cooperating very closely. Mm. Gas is, is, is one factor that explains it. The other one is, of course, the position of Rotterdam with oil importation, oil imports, basically oil uh, comes also through Rotterdam. Yeah. Uh, coal, the same, similarly, uh, coal is... But maybe no, for now to keep it on gas, yeah. July 2020, uh, Robert Habeck, uh, Rob Jette, yeah. Yeah. they're on the same table. Yeah. What do you advise Rob Jette to handle a request to reopen the gas field? Well, we, I think we, 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 I think we have properly uh, advised and I think uh, Rob Jetton did not did not need that advice because he could tell them. Uh, kill because I, I I read that your advice might have been ask him if he can reopen nuclear centers or at least. Uh, oh well, I think we, we we have of course that was a discussion also in Germany. They have of course um, decided on Atomausstieg, uh, so to to ban nuclear. Yeah. They decided that uh, I think there was a very rushed uh, decision 2014. To, to to ban nuclear and uh, and have been very consistent, and that's that's supported by the broad political spectrum in Germany. So well, that is not going to change. Is is there Groningen? So and uh, and of course there was the Groninger gas, and we said well Groninger gas will stop. That's not a possibility, but we will supply you with gas through imports. We still have gas fields in the North Sea, small ones, and we will do anything to help you out through LNG. Uh, so LNG, liquid natural gas, that is being imported from elsewhere in the world, brought to Rotterdam, to the north of the Netherlands, to Eemshaven, and that's then being transported through the existing gas pipeline infrastructure to Germany. Speaking of uh, the existing uh, gas pipeline infrastructure, uh, Nord Stream 2, um, well, and right now there's a big hole in it, but yeah. uh, back in the day it was uh, quite a big pipeline, and 9% of it was owned by Gasuni, yeah. uh, Dutch company. Yeah. Um, in hindsight, wha wha was it the mistake of the Netherlands to to participate in such a project? Yeah, it's in hindsight, uh, it, everything is easy to explain. Yes, and I, this I, is a look at back. It was an easy question for you. What Rob. you shouldn't do, um, and in hindsight, you could say uh, it was not a good decision. Still, um, at that time, I I was at the opening of Nord Stream One. It was when actually there were still very good relationships with Russia. Mm. And in hindsight, you should say we have been naive. We could already have guessed as from 2002, actually. So do you think Germany sleepwalked into this? No, and uh, well, we all sleepwalked into it. Okay. I mean, I think we have been alerted a bit more. We have been alerted um, uh, at, at once at 2014 at the MH17 when when the airplane was shot over in the east of Ukraine. Uh, so there was a big wake-up call for the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. But I also remember that 2008, when uh, when uh, Russian troops invaded uh, Georgia, um, we could have known, actually, that this regime had far-stretching and very aggressive ambitions. Mm -hmm. And at that point, um, the... the, the, the the, the building of Nord Stream 2 had not, had, still had to be decided. Mm. So we have been naive. 
That's for sure. Mm. But we all have been naive, not just Germany. Um, if you had to take a guess, who do you think sabotaged Nord Stream 2? That's a good guess. Uh, you know, that's a <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I, I, I think that's that's something I really, I really couldn't tell. Mm. I really, uh, because I don't know. I mean, I, I, th there's always been a guess. Uh, would this come from Russia? Would this be f come from Ukraine? Mm. Would it come from some forces? U U US, because the United States has always advocated against Nord Stream 2 uh, and Nord Stream 1. Um, they did some also for their own economic purposes, because it's, it's kind of strange that we don't want fracking gas in Europe, because we say fracking is very damaging to nature, uh, it's very damaging to your environment. But what we do now is we import fracking gas from Canada, from North America, from... Uh, yeah. and, uh, and, and with the same consequences there. With the same consequence, in addition, uh, the gas has to be transported yeah. across the big Atlantic. Ships, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then we have to uh, to leash uh, these big floating storage units uh, in our ports, Rotterdam, Eemshaven, yeah. uh, to actually to bring this LNG to land, uh, which is very costly, uh, which is actually very inefficient. Um, uh, but, but this is actually this this is this is how politics works because no one here in the Netherlands, no one in Germany, wants fracking in his neighborhood. No, and probably for good reasons. But yeah, I mean, the, 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 it it was lovely the gas manifesting itself into your uh, home, and you didn't have to think about where it came from. No, but that was always energy. We always believed energy was it was a given thing. Yeah, yeah. it was cheap. It was abundant supply, and actually we have. We had that same experience in the Netherlands that like, your gas was always there and it didn't cost us so much. So that is not changing. I'm looking at the time. We should get to the audience questions. Yeah. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand and then we will come to you with a, a microphone. Um, yes, you. Um, you surely touched um, upon the German sentiment towards Europe being more, yeah, more positivistic than uh, the Dutch one. Mm -hmm. um, in recent years and also decades, we've seen Southern European states being more on the receiving end of European financial plans than the Northern states or maybe Germany. Um, then how do you explain this this sentiment of Germany being so so strong for Europe? Maybe even stronger than the Dutch one. Oh, I think I I explained it to the basically post-war, post-second world war attitude of Germany, saying that um, they very strongly believe in European cooperation, and also that this brings peace, stability, uh, and also welfare. So I think that's a firm belief. It's firmly rooted uh, across the political spectrum in Germany. Um, a apart from the far right and the far left, but let's say uh, the, the, the main political parties in Germany uh, have a firm belief that this is the case. Um, the other thing is that the German economy by and large benefits from the European internal market. I mean, their industries produce not only for China, they produce for Italy, Spain as well. Uh, by the way, the same goes for the Dutch economy. I mean, Dutch industries produce uh, huge supplies for the for the uh, for the agro food industries in Italy. So we also we we, we benefit from uh, let's say also the European funding for for Europe in ways of infrastructural projects, etc. is also beneficial. So actually, it's it's two sided. It's as part of it is firm belief. You could say idealistic motives. But there are always, there's always also an economic part to that. Very well. Uh, yes, you. And um, and I was wondering, um, yeah, I, ju uh, I just recently the German government was also new with a new three-party coalition that has been struggling a bit recently. Um, I think, especially in the last week, there was a big discussion also going into the European Union about e-fuels and uh, the combustion engine car. Yeah. Um, then also they arrived in Rotterdam after a 20-hour overnight uh, negotiation session in Berlin, um, being probably very tired in Rotterdam then. 
Um, I was wondering, do you experience like a change in how you uh, interact with like the German government or the Dutch government interact with the German government after, you know, having these three party coalitions and that are in itself not really always on the same line? Uh -huh. Well, I think that uh, what, what most people I speak to in Berlin always say is that they find it very difficult to work in a three-party coalition because they were always governed in a coalition with two parties and they find it extremely difficult. And I, I then tell them <laughs> that uh, to me that feels uh, three parties feels like a luxury uh, yeah, situation yeah, yeah, yeah. where you only have to deal with three parties. So from a Dutch perspective, that is a bit strange because, and, and but it also, it means something. It means that in the Netherlands, I think we have a very good coordinating structure uh, that has developed over the years because of these many party coalitions. And in Germany, that's not always the case. So you see that um, political ministries, they coordinate according to political color. Uh, so the ministries that are governed by a social democrat minister, they coordinate the policies. Uh, Grünen, the minister, they coordinate. But across parties, they don't. Huh? And, uh, and the same thing is that ministers can just, in public, they can see completely different things about a given subject. If that happens in the Netherlands, uh, if two ministers uh, say something different about a topic, then they are immediately called to parliament because the parliament says, Explain to us what is this? Uh, is it a unity of government policy or not? And that is, I think, in, that that's a market difference. In Germany, I think there is a uh, this e-fuels um, is an is a, is an example of this, where you see there is of course three parties with different views as to how the economy should function. It's also a problem. This country, Germany, in the last year has uh, allocated 400 billion euros to uh, mitigate the impact of the Russian war. So a military support, uh, energy alleviation, and support to industry and society. So 400 billion euros is a big, even for Germany, that's big money. Um, actually, it's the same time now that this government presents its legislative proposals. They create new legislation. And one of the proposals was, of course, to ban actually to ban fossil fuels in heating. Uh, but there's, a, there's also a financial paragraph attached to that. And then, of course, there's a problem how to finance this green transition. And there you see the Greens and the Liberals. They have a different attitude. They have a different view as how to finance this uh, and how to stipulate this in legislation. I think there's a third element explaining this divergent views, and that is that they have almost on a permanent basis, elections in Germany. And since this government came into place about a year ago, uh, in all the subsequent elections in Lender, the Liberals have actually have lost. They have lost uh, and, and they, because of the threshold. They even were kicked out of parliaments. They were kicked out of governments. They were kicked out of parliaments. So actually you see that the position is hardening inside the government. Uh, so they be, because of course they want to win back support, and uh, well the same might, might have, the, the same will happen in the Netherlands. My view, my personal view, so but the same will happen in the Netherlands after our provincial elections, where you see that actually all the government parties they lost. Uh, so you say in your personal opinion the government will fall? No, and I said. Yeah. No, did I say that the government? No, I didn't say that. No, no, but it's will be yeah, because you said they kicked out of go government. Oh, uh, no, the, the liberal. No, the, the the liberals were kicked out of government, but that creates is a factor in explaining why there is so much tension within the German government. Okay, and but, and, and, but and the same, same tension when you see now the elections in the Netherlands, you will have the same uh, impact on uh, all these. But all the parties have actually lost uh, in the provincial elections. Yeah. So of course that creates. It'll Create tension. Yeah, look, look at the look at these discussions right now on nitrogen. Uh, are we are we sticking to our goals and ambitions, or are we postponing? Yeah, so this this is the discussion, and uh, and and here it's about nitrogen, and in Germany it's about greening these economy and society. Sorry, the all right. Um, let us continue with the interview. There was a question uh, in the back there, but I don't know. You you raised your finger. It's a, is it still over? I, uh, oh, I think we need to. You, you were in charge. I was. 
Uh, I think we we have like uh, f four minutes left and okay. uh, ten ten questions left, so we we, we will ask. I would like to ask like two more, mm -hmm. and maybe we'll end with your question. Then. That's uh, I think you're the good way to go. Okay, right. So um, you already touched a little bit upon the military collaboration yeah. between the two countries. We want to take a closer look at that. So during the Scholz's Zeitenwende, a huge increase in military spending yeah. was announced. Um, how was the remilitarization of Germany perceived by the Dutch government? But this is not a remilitarization. Sorry, I, I think that actually the spending, military spending is long overdue because Germany, like the Netherlands, has never met the target of 2%, spending 2% of your budget on military, as was agreed upon by NATO a long time ago. And actually last year they decided that they tried to reach this 2%. Uh, the same was decided by the Dutch government. This Dutch government also decided. So actually, they are taking similar positions. I think what was remarkable was that Germany decided to deliver arms and military support to a country in war. Because this was the post-war experience of Germany. They would never, never supply weapons, armaments or training to countries uh, that were engaged in a conflict. So this is, I think this is the real Zeitenwende in Germany, where they decided to do so. And actually they gave massive support to Ukraine. Mm. I think they are the second, large, uh, second largest provider of military support after the United States of America. Do you think that's a one time off or would they... Uh, we are the fifth, by the way, yeah? so we are also taking a... Uh, do you think this was a one time off of Germany? No, oh, I don't think so. It's a change in strategy. I think it's changing. I think there is a, there's been, Ukraine has been a big wake up call. And that means that we will devote substantially more means to defense and, uh, and also trying to strengthen our cooperation within NATO and within Europe. Mm. Also by joining, let's say, forces when it comes to industrial production, which has also been long neglected. And last week, um, there was also announced that Dutch infantry brigades will be incorporated or integrated uh, yes. in the Dutch military, yeah. which is quite a massive step compared with the collaboration yeah. of other countries. Um, what contributed to such a deep level of military cooperation? Yeah, I think the cooperation between land forces has always been very, very good. Uh, actually, it goes back to the old times when, um, when the wall was still in place and where Europe was divided into East and West, where actually Dutch troops were already stationed in Germany. I think many people of my generation serving in the army uh, were stationed in Germany. And actually that integration, actually the decision was taken long ago. Mm -hmm. And actually you, what happens now is that the integration has, has been completed mm -hmm. because it, was been, it has been underway for a long time. It's the first case of such integration between two countries. Uh, and uh, at least within NATO. Yeah, and do, do, do you expect many more steps in the future on this? Is there? We're now looking. We're now looking at more uh, cooperation uh, at the level of uh, marine forces. Okay. Yeah. Which, by the way, we already do with Belgium. So it's uh, yeah. with Belgium, uh, our, our our sea forces are are practically integrated. Yeah. So that means uh, Belgian marines serving on Dutch ships and vice versa. Are we working towards a Dutch-German army? Well, I think we always hold our command structures. Yeah. And that, that, that will be the case for a long time. But but this is actually, uh, land forces is an integrated command structure. Yeah. With the Dutch commander-in-chief, General uh, Tuck. Uh, also, there is a, there is a, there's a, but, but still then, of course, the decision, uh, it, it, the decision actually to actually use this integrated force uh, is taken by two governments. Yes, 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 yes. But could you see in the future maybe ha uh, uh, all the parts of the of the military b being integrated and then having uh, two command structures? More or less, but I'm not necessarily always with Germany, because as I say, uh, with Air Force, we cooperate very closely and we've done so for the past 30 years with Norway. Yeah. Now that now that Germany actually has also chosen for the F 35s so the American uh, air strikers, that of course makes integration cooperation easier because we have taken that decision a long time ago. Yeah. 
So the more European army like. Uh, but then again, you have of course the French that are they, they are a bit sour because that because they have chosen for an American fighter and not for a French uh, La Fande. So so this there's always this, that's all, all also here you see this competition between two major European powers. And let's say um, a European army has often been described as a puzzle piece in European sovereignty. Yes. Would that replace Dutch military cooperation? Oh, no, and I think also you have to be very modest in when it comes to European cooperation. That is important, of course. But uh, but I think NATO still is in the lead. They will be in the lead for a long time. Because I think both Germany and the Netherlands, we, we share a common conviction. And that is that we cannot do without the support of the Americans. So we will always want to cooperate and keep the USA involved in our military strategy. And that's what we need NATO for. Very clear. We'll go to your question and I have the last question here after that. Okay. Um, where's the microphone? Oh, there. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for coming and also for the interesting conversation. Um, I wanted to ask, what advice can you give to students interested in pursuing a career in diplomacy? Sorry, I, I, I haven't got that question, right? Uh, the advice you could give to students interested in pursuing a career in diplomacy. All right. Uh, yeah, would I advise you to pursue a career in diplomacy? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, I think it's, uh, I would, I would certainly, uh, do that because I and I tremendously like I, I like I, I like the I like the word of diplomacy. Uh, I think it would be very good to um, to pursue traineeships. Uh, it depends a bit on what you want, but I think what is a very good basis for a start is uh, a traineeship in Brussels because Brussels actually is the bubble where everything happens. So either at the embassy, either at the commission or at one of the embassies. So I think that provides a very good basis. But I am generally, I think we, we offer traineeships also at our embassy in Berlin. And we, we are very fond and keen of having students. And I think that gives you a very first glance of what it means, what it implies. And, uh, and, and secondly, I think you, you have to pursue you, you, you need to have a genuine interest in working with people in networking and also working and living abroad, which, which, uh, which has great advantages, but it also has certain disadvantages. So, uh, so I think motivation is a very important thing. Uh, mastery of languages is of course important. Uh, and, and that is, uh, and in general interest in international politics. I mean, you have to know something about European cooperation. You have to know something about how the UN functions uh, and then actually what you study is is not that important. I mean, I have colleagues who have who have studied uh, veterinary medicine of or or, or languages or, or whatever. I mean, you can you can do with actually any study techniques, uh, whatever, as long as you have a genuine interest in international politics. All right, then we already come to the last question of this interview. So, looking at all the challenges that we have discussed today. What do you hope to achieve within your time as an ambassador? With a new? Within your time as an ambassador. A new? Well, I think, with me, I, I think what is important is to uh, actually also establish context where they seem logic, but where it's not running that well. Mm -hmm. And for, for me, because as I say, uh, many exchange, a lot of exchange between the Netherlands and Germany is a self-sloifer. It goes without interference of the embassy or diplomats and so on. Uh, but some of these, I would, for instance, what I think is very important is more exchange between younger generations. And I see that is kind of, um, people go to Germany on holidays, Germans come to the Netherlands for holidays, and we have the impression that we understand each other and that we have a very similar culture. At the same time, I think there are many differences. There's a rich diversity. Um, I would, I would very much hope to stimulate actually more exchange uh, of younger generations. Um, I'm discussing that also with the, with the uh, the, the Deutschland uh, Deutschland Institute, the Deutschland Institute here, also House the Niederlande Münster, how to engage young people to engage in contacts, 
and uh, and and I would I would like to work a bit more on that structure. We have a forum, Dutch Netherlands forum, but that is a bit. Um, it's too senior people. It's too formal, and I'm looking for more informal structures. And suddenly, also universities, uh, you as students, you can help a lot to uh, to improve that. And we wish you best of luck with that, Ronald. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us today. Also, thank you for being here today. You can find all of our upcoming interviews on our social media, so that's YouTube, Spotify, and Instagram. And uh, to stay up to date and receive exclusive content, you can sign up for our newsletter, which you can find on our website. Make sure uh, to join our next interview with former Shell CEO Jeroen van der Veer on the 12th of April. Uh, it is Wednesday next week. And uh, one day after that, we have Geoffrey Robertson. He's an Australian human rights barrister with high profile cases such as Julian Assange. And he used to work with the wife of George Clooney. Well. If that's not enticing, I don't know what is. Uh, that's on the 13th of April, so be very welcome then. Um, thank you so much for your time. Please give a round of applause to Mr. Van Roeden. Thank you very much.